Yeah, Lord, uh, good ones up some interesting points there. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Right Honorable Abdul Khan MP to step forward uh, and express his views in terms of the lockdown in the current situation and what the government and opposition in this country are involved in uh, and, and how we can keep the Kashmir issue um, in people's minds. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and assalamu alaikum to all of you. Uh, like others, let me start by first of all thanking the Tariq e Kashmir and uh, Fahim Kiani for pulling us together on this uh, very important uh, subject. Uh, it's also an honor uh, to share my thoughts with the esteemed speakers that we already had, and we're going to have, of course, the Honorable President of Sardar. Uh, Masood Khan, uh, whose contribution has been amazing for this cause. Uh, today, you know, we're doing this Zoom conference. Um, and when we see this in comparison, uh, I suppose one of the points perhaps we should be making is that what the Kashmiris have been going through for so long, and in particular the last eight months, the world also is experiencing a similar idea. So we hope through this, there will be more empathy towards Kashmiris. We have got this opportunity to speak to one another. And we know that the Kashmiris for eight months, they've had this lockdown where even the internet had been shut down. And what little they have now is also to what you could say is a 2G level, which really is insufficient. So a person like myself and many other people are actually being able to work from home. This opportunity actually has been denied to the Kashmiri people. Uh, they have not been able to, and whilst we may be in the fourth week, they've been in for the eight weeks now. And I think we've also seen the devastation of COVID-19 uh, in the world. You know, if you turn any news, you'll see this uh, dominating news. But can you then imagine the situation in Kashmir? Uh, the two big impacts of COVID-19, which we are experiencing, is health, and the second big one, which will be for some time to come, will be economy. So what sort of access is being made available for the occupied Kashmiris? And this whole lockdown, I think it's clear uh, that they're ill-equipped to deal with it. So again, this is against the humanity idea for them to be put into this position. I only, I think yesterday, somebody sent me a WhatsApp message, which I thought in a way really summed it up, that in the occupied Kashmir, you have one doctor to 4,000 people. And the ventilator, which is the, one of the key instruments needed if things go really bad with this virus for the individual, something like one to 70,000. And at the same time, in the same land, you have a ratio of the army, which is one to under 10 soldiers. So seven, eight soldiers to one Kashmiri. So it's totally unparalleled, both on the oppression numbers and on the health side of things. Uh, so I have recently uh, submitted questions for the UK government, asking them, uh, because the number, what they're saying actually is very low. It doesn't match up. So they're not even giving, I think, the correct numbers linked to the coronavirus. And of course, we need to be asking, therefore, the adequacy of the medical supplies in that region. And thirdly, asking the UK government what further supports they can provide. Because in this uh, uh, coronavirus situation, we are all in it together uh, in the world. <clears throat> the next point I wanted to touch on was the implication of COVID-19 in the geopolitical importance point of view. 
I think what you see again is that the U.S. has been actually behind the whole curve. And many of the countries like China actually have been coming forward. We've seen recently, although the pattern goes on for some time now, that the U.S. is retreating from the multilateral organization. Only this last week, the Donald Trump, President Trump, who withdrew themselves from the World Health Organization. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, ministers from Germany summed it up and he said with the world, the situation that they are going through, it is no less than throwing a pilot out of the window, what America has done. So I think uh, there are uh, geopolitical changes that are taking place. Uh, and interestingly, China has actually been coming forward and has been helping many countries, including the UK, and this crucial time of uh, response to the global uh, COVID-19. So in my opinion, I think what you're seeing is the change that is happening. And you will see in the coming years, the influence of China is going to be continue to grow. And I think here, uh, linking this to the Kashmiri issue, it is for us in that sense important uh, that China is going to be important economically, militarily, and of course also occupies a permanent position in the UK. And they have been helpful in raising the issue of Kashmir on the international platform. So developing that strengthening relationship, I think, would be important. The other uh, bit, I suppose, a number of speakers before me have also touched it. And that really is that throughout the struggle, uh, I believe this, and I think others in this platform also share this idea, that Kashmiris uh, are the key players. They have the responsibility. They are on the front line, and they must fight this fight uh, uh, like that. Anyone else, I suppose you could argue, is a helper. So both Kashmiris in occupied Kashmir and the diaspora, which is outside, they have this key role to play. And with the coming of the blessed month of Ramadan, again, you know, we need to be fearless and we need to be really taking this uh, struggle uh, to the wider context, to the world as well. Now, moving on to media side a little bit. Uh, again, I, I think uh, this is a powerful tool uh, throughout the world, and it's an important tool to bring about awareness of what is going on. But what we again seeing is the Indian authorities, uh, they are basically bullying, intimidating journalists. Many media outlets are actively promoting the narrative of BJP and Mr. Modi. And many are, because of the fear, censoring themselves to avoid being punished. And those journalists who with integrity, then again, you, they are basically, uh, for them, uh, is taking a dark turn. A uh, number of you were touched on the recent charges against Nasser Zara. I think whilst you know, charges is an issue, but what exactly was the offense is also important to understand and which I think highlights of this extreme positioning of the Indian government. And the picture what she's being charged for is which she took of a Shia uh, Matam procession. And this picture had been printed in 2018 in the international um, media. So it's nothing new, and yet this is being used uh, to silence people like her uh, in, in this difficult times. Uh, and this is why I think uh, what we need to be is concerned with, and she's not isolated incident, 
in the last few days, we've seen people like Pizada, Ashik, uh, Gor, Jelani Saab, uh, Mehran, uh, Heather, Safora uh, Zargar, and Umar Khalid, and others, you know, who have been uh, used this tool. Um, I think the message we have to then make clear is the importance of press freedom. Uh, and this must be upheld. And reporting is not an offense. The BJP government, I think, again, when you look at the actions they're doing, they're actually rolling back some of the secular progress which had been made over many decades in India. So we are now seeing this rise of right-wing narrative and populism. And, and this, sadly, is not just in India. There are a number of other places where this takes place. And again, in the past, I've used the idea that uh, there is excess of extremism taking place. There are a number of other leaders in the world with a similar narrative. And not only they're giving the similar narrative, but what you see is they're aiding and abetting one another. And so hence the whole atmosphere in the world, it has to be questioned what is happening. And, and then in India and in occupied Kashmir, what again you see the highlight is this uh, stoking up of the anti-Muslim sentiments, uh, marginalizing other minorities uh, during this time of crisis. Uh, their uh, human rights violations are being sort of uh, not being held to, uh, for any accountability. Uh, we're seeing the rampant Islamophobia incidents. Uh, state themselves is leading and encouraging the charge against the Muslims, not only in Kashmir, but also in India as a whole. Uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, you saw this, so many videos were coming through where police were aiding and abetting the thugs. This just could, would not happen in any normal civilized society. Uh, and then and some of the leadership, including some Muslim leadership in India of in position, like Minister Mukhtar Abbas Nakhvi, and, and he is on record saying that India is a heaven for Muslims and minorities. When I read that, I really uh, wasn't sure, is this a joke or is he playing the Mir Jaffa's role, which we've seen in the history? But ultimately, despite all this, uh, what is happening, uh, we know from history that power has a shelf life. And what we are seeing now in India is the beginning of the cracks in India. Uh, and I think ultimately they cannot carry on with this. We all have a responsibility to highlight this and takes this, this takes me to the next point and that is the role of the UN uh, itself. Uh, I think our esteemed speaker, uh, Sadat Saab, has got a huge experience on this. But you know, one thing is clear, the Secretary General has stated that the fury of the virus illustrates that the folly of war. So in, if this is the top leadership unit is saying, then why is it the regular violation of line of controls, which UN observers themselves are aware of, they're not actually coming to the public. Why are they not saying it? So the people actually understand and that who is responsible, who is the perpetrator, and who are exactly the victims. So India's continuous violation of UN resolutions, the status of Kashmiris following the revocation of Article 370 and uh, 35A, it, 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 to me, it's likening to the situation of what has been happening for so long with Palestinians. This whole idea of denial of the refugees, stealing of the land, changing of the demographic, is this challenge which is there, which is in violation of the UN resolutions. And I think the UN has a responsibility and other responsible states have a responsibility to speak out and to stop this. As a member of parliament, I mean, I will raise these issues. Uh, many uh, other of my colleagues uh, will do the same. They've got a long track record, people like Lord Nazir Ahmed, 
uh, I'm someone who's grown up uh, trying to learn from him. And we have now others in the parliament, the numbers are also increasing. We have uh, uh, attempting to have a debate in parliament. Sadly, due to the coronavirus situation, this de debate was canceled. We are just waiting for it, the slot to get this uh, again into the system. But I'm confident that will happen because it was already on the system. Uh, it's only because trying to set up a new system of how to operate uh, uh, is what is being tweaked out. And we are uh, we're moving ahead with the speed. And coming to an end, what I probably would say is that, look, on a positive side is that this uh, current position of the Kashmiri people, more and more globally, uh, there is awareness coming through, which I think is helpful. You will see parliaments like Britain, increased number of MPs are now participating, taking interest, which I think can only be a good thing. I think looking ahead, uh, we have to keep driving this point that the Kashmiris themselves have to be the center of any negotiation. They are the party who are actually suffering and no one else can know better than them what it's all about. And it's their freedom that we're talking about. And I think the idea of bilateral issues, again, if we had enough of this for so long, it's not going anywhere. And you just can't simply hide behind this wall. You know, there has to be responsibility at a multilateral approach to get this uh, situation resolved. Cover 19, like Lord Nazir Ahmed Saab, I think put it rightly, look, don't look at it in a negative sense. See it as an opportunity. See it as an opportunity through which we can upscale ourselves and open up new ways of communicating with the world through this. And again, I think uh, it was rightly pointed out with the extreme, uh, which is happening in both in India and occupied Kashmir, the Middle East side, is the sand is shifting. Uh, more and more people are becoming aware of this extreme nature of this Indian government. And they are also speaking. Uh, I, this morning I saw a Kuwaiti leading a human rights person who did a short video uh, for the Arab world, really again highlighting what exactly is happening. So all these things I think will help us. And once again, can I thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and to listen to our esteemed speakers.